Todd mentioned in his introductory remar remarks that I had begged uh, for the opportunity uh, to do a different exercise or a supplemental exercise to uh, what everybody else did. First of all, uh, we had sort of done a very much a budget constrained exercise when we did our skimmer review uh, last year. And uh, secondly, uh, as, as, as much as anybody, the guy who wrote the QDR original legislation, I've been carrying around a very heavy uh, piece of baggage for about 20 years now. Uh, and um, I think Cord Sterling is lurking around here some, somewhere. Uh, Cord blamed me then, and he could probably still want to blame me for it now, but he was my unindicted co-conspirator in that. But the purpose of the QDR was to be budget neutral, to be unconstrained, to do strategy first and establish resources afterwards. So an exercise that begins with budget levels constrains strategy. And not surprisingly, when you compare what all four of us did with the diminished budget levels that are available under the BCA or even the more liberal half BCA scenario, there's hardly a dime's worth of difference between us. The lack of resources constrains the exercise of strategy. So Todd allowed me, if not to redeem myself, at least to absolve myself of my past sins. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to you about is the sort of unconstrained uh, version that we did. We began with what we thought was an adequate strategy for uh, retaining America's global leadership posture. And then we tried to come up uh, with what a force posture and a force planning uh, construct was, which is, again, what the QDR is about. The QDR is not a strategy-making exercise. It's an execution exercise. It takes the national security strategy and the national military strategy, and it tries to quantify it in terms of what forces are required, what systems are required, and importantly, what budget levels are required. So that's what we tried to do. And I'm just going to go through a couple of the slides because I want to get uh, really just convey not the details of uh, what our uh, uh, programmatic choices were, uh, which are available in the handouts, uh, but I want to run through the concept very briefly. Our force sizing construct is what I would call a 2 one, one force sizing construct. Like any company commander or battalion commander, I'm going to put two up, have one back, and one in reserve. So I particularly want to patrol the front lines uh, in the Asia Pacific and in the Middle East. And I particularly wanted to try to find out what it would take, given the Middle East as it is today, what it would take to try to get our arms around the Middle East again. So I'm just going to go through really simply uh, what we want the force to accomplish and what we think is essential for strategic success and preserving an international system uh, of the sort that we've all become used to, accustomed to, and has produced uh, not only peace but prosperity and liberty. But it's true that we need to uh, focus again on the Asia Pacific region, and geography is geography. If you go back to Dean Acheson's original 1950 speech, where he unfortunately left Korea out of the perimeter, he traced a line that goes from the Aleutians through Japan to the Philippines, what we now, or what the Chinese refer to as the first island chain. That's our frontline perimeter in the Pacific, and it's been that way since the end of World War II. It hasn't changed now. In fact, the value of it is, is greater than it's ever been. East Asia is richer and freer uh, than it's ever been, and more, uh, more stable and more peaceful. This is a, you know, something worth keeping. So we have to patrol that front line. It's enormous from north to south. We're in good shape pretty much in Northeast Asia, although we recommended a number of changes there. We have withdrawn from Southeast Asia by our departure from the Philippines in the 1980s, but now we're getting uh, sucked back in there. And if you look at the handout charts, uh, you'll see uh, a piece of work we've done to track the incidence uh, of Chinese boat bumping and airplane bumping, essentially trying to muscle people like the Filipinos uh, and the Indonesians uh, out of the way in the South China Sea. And that's a trend line that's accelerating. There's a second chart that shows the frequency of these things. We have got to patrol that front line. 
but we've got to be able to support it as well. And the kind of power projection uh, and anti-access capabilities that the People's Liberation Army is acquiring make our ability to reinforce that front line ever more tenuous, particularly when it comes to the Philippine Sea, which is the area outlined in yellow there. And it puts at risk all the investment we've made in Guam over these years. We have to reestablish our ability to operate from deep lying positions, to project power forward, and also to swarm, if you will, uh, in ways uh, that uh, create uh, a more robust form of deterrence, of conventional deterrence for the Chinese. And I'm not, again, not going to go through the programmatics in detail, but that's the concept that we're trying to support. And if we're not able to do that, our global position and our position in the Asia Pacific will be compromised. There's the charts I was telling you about. There are the details. And now to talk about the 800 pound gorilla in the room. This is how we would sort of assess what's happening in the Middle East today. There's, in particular, uh, thanks to our uh, withdrawal from Iraq and our failure to intervene in Syria, what amounts to a strategic meeting engagement going on between an Iranian-led, loosely Shia coalition and a Saudi-led, loosely, even more loosely organized Sunni coalition and with uh, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates in the middle. That central piece of geography, which has always been critical to the balance of power in the Middle East, is now up for grabs. And both sides that are squabbling for it uh, are both uh, somewhat weak and not going to pursue American interests, necessarily. So the question for us, is how do we limit the damage that's already happened, and how do we posture ourselves to be able to uh, both contain the problem, and if need be, if it gets intolerable, to be able to do something about it without having to shoot our way back in from offshore, to put it bluntly. And so what we've come up with uh, is, a, is a, um, a garrison and a, and a forward positioning um, concept not dissimilar to what we have in Kuwait today. A small ground force and the ability to project power, particularly air power, uh, by the use of uh, airfields around the Gulf. Establishing a similar uh, power projection platform, or if I can use the term of art, uh, with the northern Gulf in mind, uh, to us seems to be essential to keep, again, keeping the situation from getting any worse than it already is, and being in a position uh, to remedy it if it gets worse, or if the need to intervene becomes compelling. The other things that we need to do uh, are obviously retain our position in South Asia, thinking about it simply as a post-Afghanistan uh, force is too narrow. South Asia is critical to the balance of power in this part of the world, and increasingly globally, not to mention the potential nuclear standoff between India and Pakistan. And then there's the question of what to do about uh, uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, groups that are increasingly pushing their way towards sub-Saharan Africa uh, and fanning the flames of conflict uh, between uh, uh, Arab regimes, Muslim societies, and sub-Saharan African regimes uh, and their predominantly Christian cultures. This is a flashpoint that we are going to find it uh, more compelling to pay attention to, which a small amount of force uh, would help to ameliorate, if not to remedy in any near term a way. But again, something that's essential to preserving a region that's a contributor, or at least not uh, a, a net negative for global stability and security. Those are the two things I really wanted to stress. Finally, uh, I wanted to go through some of the details uh, of the program that we came up with and to compare it to what's in the program and what has been in the program in the past. Our basic idea is to keep the force that we've got, keep its size, and to uh, uh, go slowly on cutting 
the sustainment structures, be they civilian or contractor, that allow a very small force to operate globally. There's a huge number of contractors out there and defense civilians out there. I'm not sure I know what they are doing, but I defy anybody to describe, in fact, what they're doing. Nobody else knows what they're doing. And just taking a schwack out of that sustainment and support structure is bound to have consequences. And as inviting it is it is when you need to harvest money, there's going to be consequences of cutting it. We did want to modernize. We wanted to buy what's available. As Senator McCain says, we spent a lot of money developing some pretty good aircraft and other programs, other uh, capabilities. We now need to recoup that investment. We need to proliferate it amongst our allies and friends. They're what's available. And if the crisis is as much near term, if not more so than long term, we have to deal with the program and the budget and the industry we have. We spent a lot of money in our exercise trying to uh, create access and log the logistics and sustainment capabilities that would allow for the sustainment and operations of a, a large force, particularly in the Pacific, which is a long way away, as you may have noticed. And I did want to say, too, that as hard as we tried, we couldn't spend as much money as we probably thought we were going to. When you look at our budget numbers, our unconstrained uh, AEI on the loose budget numbers, we, didn't, we weren't able to buy back all the cuts that were originally taken away uh, uh, in the 2011 BCA. We did constrain ourselves by thinking of what the industry could digest rationally, or what the art of the possible was. And it really tells you that it'll take 10 years or more to intelligently reinflate uh, the defense institutions that we're going to need. If you compare it to what the projections for the uh, overall U.S. economy are, we still didn't meet that old Heritage Foundation, the conservative uh, benchmark of 4% uh, for freedom. And finally, if you compare it to sequestration, where we're headed, it is a huge gap. The gap between what we thought was reasonable to spend to achieve a marginal uh, strategy and to reduce risk to a manageable level is $800 billion over the 10-year period. So if we do go down to sequestration, our ability to execute a global strategy is going to be really tenuous at best. That's all I got. <laughs>